Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on plant simulation. After reviewing how the program interface and the class library work in the previous video, we can now start creating our first simulation models. During this and the following videos in this series, we are going to explain how the main basic plant simulation objects work, what attributes we are interested in knowing, and how they are related to each other, always using examples to understand everything better. Before continuing, I would like to make a clarification. It is not the objective of these tutorials to cover 100% of the objects or their attributes. If you have any specific questions that are not resolved, I always recommend that you first read the program's own help, which is very well documented and very easy to access. You will find it in the Home tab of the General Toolbar here on the right. But you can also open the specific help for an object through its menu, for example. If we open this object in the Help menu, Help on Object would directly open the Help page for this object. And if not, there's also the option to select the object and press F1. I also leave you in the description the link to the Plant Simulation Online Forum, where you can share your doubts and let other members of the community provide solutions, or even members of the Siemens team who sometimes also respond. Finally, of course, you can also write me your questions in a comment, and I will try to answer you as soon as possible. That said, the first object we are going to explain, and perhaps the most important of all, is the event controller. We will find it here in Material Flow, and it is inserted by default in the model frames. It is the object that will control the passage of time in our simulation. Plant simulation only allows us to have one for each frame, so if we try to insert another one, it is automatically deleted. But how exactly does time work in plant simulation? As we said in the previous video, plant simulation is a discrete event simulation software, which means that time does not pass continuously as in real life, but is ordered as a series of events associated with a moment of time specifically and without continuity between them. Let's explain this a little better. All discrete event simulation software has four shared characteristics. The first is what we call a state function. For each commercial software, this can be solved in different ways, but broadly speaking, the state function is the set of variables that define the state of our model at any instant. On the other hand, we have a list of events. We will call events all the actions that occur during the simulation and that modify the state function in some way. We also have triggers, that is, objects that will generate the actions that appear in the list of events. And finally, we have the clock, which is responsible for moving time forward. And how does it do it? Well. Once we have calculated the list of events, it jumps directly to the next point in the list, executes all the triggers, updates the state function, and recalculates the list of events so that the simulation makes time jumps from event to event. Let's understand it better with a simplified example. Let's imagine a truck into which packages enter every 15 seconds. At first, the list of events will look like this. Every 15 seconds, a new box enters the truck, so a new event is generated. As these events are planned in time, the listing already begins with all these calculated events. The clock can therefore jump every 15 seconds to the next event, since there is nothing else to change the state function in between. Now let's imagine that instead of a constant flow of boxes, there is a sensor at the entrance of the truck. And this, by reading the information in the box, calculates how long it will take to reach the next one. That is, the entry of boxes will no longer be constant every 15 seconds, but will depend on the type of box that we load at each moment. In this case, at the beginning of the simulation, the event list will have only one event. The first box will enter at the second zero, but once that action is executed, the list of events will be recalculated, and we will once again have a single event, which will be the entry of the next box. Let's see how all these concepts are implemented in the event controller. Open it, and the first thing we see are the command buttons in the center of the menu. With this we can start, which would be this button here, and also pause the simulation, reset it, but also run it without animation, that is, run it at maximum speed, and only execute the next event in the list of events. The last button allows us to open precisely that list of events, in which right now we only have the initial event, but later we will see how it is updated. 
Below the control buttons, we have the simulation speed controls. We can control it in two different ways, either by moving the cursor between faster and slower, or by selecting this option here and defining how many times faster than the real time we want to go. Above everything, we see the simulation timer that tells us how long it has been simulated so far. We also have the settings tab that we will see later. For now, we are going to create a simple simulation model to better see how the list of events works. To do this, we are going to use five of the most essential objects from the Material Flow tab to simulate any type of production flow. To begin, we will insert the source object, which works as a source or a constant generator of parts. We are also going to insert a station object. This object represents a machine that applies a generic production process on the parts, which is represented by a process time that by default is 10 seconds. Next, we will insert a conveyor. This object represents a conveyor belt, for instance, the ones that move suitcases at an airport. By inserting it, we can define with the mouse the length and the number of sections that we want to add to the conveyor object. If we press Shift, we will be forcing it to follow the point pattern of the frame itself. To make curves, we can do it by holding down the control button. When we want to finish, we press right-click. At the end, we will insert a drain that plays an opposite role to that of the source. We are going to rotate it with control T so that it fits well in the path of the pieces. Where the source is an infinite source of parts, the drain acts as a sink. If we run the simulation right now, what we see is that the pieces are not moving through our model. This occurs because planned simulation is not able to know which objects we want the pieces to pass through once they leave the source. So let's reset this simulation and define that order. For this, we will use the connector object. We simply click on it and connect the different elements in the order we want. If we want to connect more than one element at a time, it is as simple as holding down the control button and it will let us do it. Now, if we reopen the event controller and run the simulation, we will see the material flow through the model. As we see, the pieces constantly leave the source, enter the station, wait there for 10 seconds, and then arrive at the drain through the conveyor. Perhaps of the entire scheme, the least intuitive to understand is the drain, but let's see what happens if we disconnect it from the flow. After a few seconds, our entire flow collapses because the pieces accumulate on the conveyor. In a real process, the drain would represent, for example, an operator who takes those pieces from the conveyor, but who is outside the scope of what we are simulating. Now we are going to take advantage of this small model to see how the list of events behaves. We open it, leave it here on one side, and click on Play. As we see, the list orders the following events that are going to occur and at the moment in which they are going to occur. And every time the next event is reached, it is not only removed from the list, but the entire list is re-evaluated. It might seem that time does pass continuously, but that is because, on the one hand, we have the animation activated, which is this event that appears here constantly, and on the other, we are forcing the speed to be three times real time. Let's uncheck both options to see what actually happens. The first is disabled here, in the Home tab of the toolbar, and the second in the event controller, as we have already seen. Now we can see that the simulation time jumps towards the next event discontinuously. If we want, we can even stop the simulation and force it to jump from event to event manually. With this, we have seen one of the most important objects, the event controller, and we have understood its operation with a simple example. In the next videos, we will see in more detail each of the objects that we have used, and we will begin to solve exercises. Greetings, and until the next video.